thank you all so much for coming out and thank you to our sponsors tonight and to John Carter Cash and Anna Christina Cash for performing. It's really great to see you all. The mission of Tennessee Riverkeeper is to protect the Tennessee and the Cumberland Rivers and the tributaries from pollution. We do that by enforcing environmental laws and educating the public. And we protect the water for 6.3 million Southerners. We are not afraid to litigate against the illegal polluters when we find it. And we also educate the public through the press and through social media and through events like this. The first Riverkeeper I started was Black Warrior Riverkeeper, which is based in Birmingham and Tuscaloosa. And it's called Black Warrior Riverkeeper, named after Chief Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa means Black Warrior. He was a, a prominent chieftain from the Mississippian tribe. And the Native Americans were really the first environmentalists. My favorite Johnny Cash album is called Bitter Tears. And it's all about the plight of Native Americans and what they've gone through in our country. Columbia Records begged him not to produce that album or record that album. Throughout Bitter Tears, there is a theme of not only the horror and the, the tragic conditions and the treatment that we, that we gave the Native Americans, but it also talks about how the earth was their mother and the importance that they had on water. The first song is How Green Shall the Grass Grow. It talks about the chief corn planter who made an agreement with George Washington and the American government that eventually our government reneged on. And they ended up building a dam on the Allegheny River and flooding their land. It also has a song called The Ballad of Ira Hayes and that talks about the Pima Indian tribe, which is from the Phoenix Valley in present day Arizona. And the US government eventually stole their water rights and made their land go dry and ultimately caused them to not be able to farm and grow food. But the Native Americans, they understood how important nature was and how important water is. And they were some of the earliest adapters of biomimicry and regenerative agriculture and all of these sort of modern concepts. Now we think they're modern, but they're really part of the wisdom of the Native American tribes. I felt a strong calling to the Tennessee River, which is also known as the Singing River by the Yuchi tribe. There's a lot of musicians that have heard the calling of the Singing River, and I think that is a major reason why music is such an important part of the Tennessee Valley. We have Muscle Shoals, and Nashville's not far off. Music is such a huge part of both of those cities. Uncoincidentally, Muscle Shoals is one of the least polluted cities in Alabama, and Nashville's one of the least polluted cities in Tennessee because they invested in creativity versus pollution or the extracting industry. There's still a strong presence of music and Native American culture and environmental values in those areas that don't exist in some of the other cities in the Tennessee Valley. I was sort of born into the Waterkeeper movement. I was, was trained in public speaking by Robert Kennedy Jr. And, with, and, and those lessons were enhanced by John Fishman from Fish. I went to the University of Vermont, which was one of the top environmental schools in the country. I had to go that far away. My senior thesis was starting Black Warrior Riverkeeper. I had to go to Burlington, Vermont, 2,000 miles away in order to start an organization that protected the Black Warrior. If I had gone to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, to the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, there was not a strong environmental program there. And a lot of the polluters were on the board of directors there and they would have fought me and tried to kick me out of school probably for trying to protect the river that flows through campus. I felt a strong passion and calling towards the music industry. My family encouraged me to pick a branch of the entertainment industry to use for support and fundraising and to, to build the kind of support it takes to run a nonprofit, especially one that aggressively litigates corporate polluters. They told me that it would be very hard to raise money from businesses because they were turned off by our litigation or they, they would be scared that we might turn around and sue them. They told me not to pursue the music industry because they would the musicians would make promises at night that they couldn't keep during the day and there was a culture of sex, drugs, and rock and roll but that was their attitude from the music industry of the 60s and 70s. At that time, I was already, I already had a lot of musician friends and was already going backstage. And what I saw backstage was more 
juicers and organic local produce and a sort of a, a, a healthy living environment. And the only drug I really saw was cannabis, a plant. And I told them that they were wrong and that was an outdated mentality. And it was really some of the only advice of my family that I refused to accept. And I went full steam into the music industry. The first band that supported my work was Fish and their Waterwheel Foundation and John Fishman. I never thought that I would find a band that was as supportive of that because they are so aquatically minded. Their logo is a fish, their name is a fish. Their namesake, his name is John Fishman and water was his issue and we bonded over that and he's still one of our, there's still the whole band and Waterwheel and John Fishman are still some of our biggest supporters today. Soon after that, I reached out to the drive-by truckers which was singing a lot of songs about Alabama and the civil rights movement and they immediately supported my work with Black Warrior Riverkeeper and begged me to start Tennessee Riverkeeper which eventually I did and this is Tennessee River, I played a role in creating six different Riverkeeper organizations that are successful. Cumulatively, they protect the water for eight million Southerners. Tennessee Riverkeeper is the biggest one by far and the hardest one it took me to create because it covers such a large area. The third musician I reached out to was Jack Johnson, who we were with two nights ago at Ascend Amphitheater on Wednesday. And Jack gives 100% of his touring income back to the environment. Jack is a former pro surfer. He also, water is his issue. He is as passionate about water as I am or any waterman I've ever met. And I realized after that, that I was onto something and that I could get these musicians to support the cause. But additionally, these mus unlike the rest of the entertainment industry, these other branches of TV or movies or any, or comedy or any other branch, they spend, they tour the country. And they have to come through Birmingham, Alabama, and Nashville, Tennessee, and Indianapolis, Indiana, and all points in between. And, and that is also one of the last places where people congregate in large numbers. So we were able to not only fundraise, but we were able to engage with concert goers and, and build our, our membership through tabling at concerts and working with venues and bands. And that's what we did two nights ago at Ascend with Jack Johnson. We would not be here with the Cash family tonight if it weren't for all of that. And soon after Jack Johnson, it was 100 musicians that supported us. And the music industry provides about a quarter of our annual budget and a significant amount of our outreach. My first memory was looking at water droplets on a window after it rained. And I got really excited about watching a tiny droplet merge with another and then merge with another and I, I would just root for it to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I remember that so vividly, but ultimately those, that's the foundation of a river and a watershed. And that was, that's the simplest lesson you can have about understanding what a watershed is. These droplets land and form these intermittent streams, which flow into larger streams and then flow into mighty rivers. But that's also illustrative of us being here tonight and our strength in numbers. And I'm just but one droplet, and we are all one droplet, but by being here together, we form bigger droplets and bigger streams that create mighty rivers. And each time we stand up against injustice or pollution or oppression, we send forth these waves of hope. And together those waves can create a tsunami of justice that will sweep down the mightiest walls of pollution and injustice and resistance and our strength is in numbers. This country seems so divided. And sometimes it seems like these massive corporations are just bullying us and polluting our planet and making us sick, but we outnumber them. And it, through events like this, and by joining your local Riverkeeper, we have 300 Riverkeepers around the world. We have 6,000 members at Tennessee Riverkeeper, but each of these other waterkeepers has about 1,000 members too. There's 300 of them in, all, in every major watershed almost, in the US, Canada, all over the world. And that's about 300,000 members. But all of those river keepers are suing polluters too. And we can impact change through that. Standing together like this, we can tear down the Midas walls, but we also build bridges that unify us as a country. If we were to talk about climate change, we get in a political debate. It's about, hey, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican. When I talk to people in the South, in the deep South, I talk to them about water. It doesn't matter how they vote. They say, where can we sign up? Because they understand 
that this is a common sense issue. We shouldn't be dumping carcinogens in our water. Our bodies are mostly are over 60% water. So by protecting the rivers, we're protecting ourselves. And there's tremendous hope in that. And each of y'all here tonight is in enhancing that hope. And finally, not all corporations are bad. I have to, you know, I get up here and I rail against corporations. We spent seven years suing 3M for PFAS pollution. We've, sued, we've cost corporations over $500 million through our litigation. They cannot stand me or the work that I do. <laughs> they call me a job killer. They call me anti-business. But I cling to Patagonia's support. Patagonia's business slogan is, we are in business to save the planet. That's not greenwashing. They are absolutely sincere. Every year they continue to blow my mind and do things like give away their Black Friday profits, spend a third of their marketing budget on an event like this to support Riverkeeper. They give me tremendous hope. I, it's the only logo I'll wear. <laughs> I cling to that hope because I, I say I'm not anti-business. Patagonia is leading the way. Look to Patagonia. You, t you, you think they're doing things that are gonna hurt their bottom line, but each time they do something aggressive for the planet or extremist in the corporate world for the planet, it makes people love them even more and their sales go up. So I cannot thank Patagonia enough. They are the real deal. We also have the Orion Amphitheater here tonight. So they're in Huntsville, Alabama, and they are doing some very aggressive things to limit their waste and to improve their sustainability in Huntsville, Alabama. It is one of the most sustainable venues in the country. You all have to go see a concert at the Orion Amphitheater. Not only is it one of the most beautiful amphitheaters in the country, it looks like it was built to the height of ancient Greece. It will blow your mind for what they're doing to reduce waste, to reduce pollution, to save the planet. And they are educating over 7,000 people at every concert. They're changing the world one concert at a time. And they're not just doing it with the progressive environmental bands, they're doing it with country artists, with hip hop artists. And so we are, are able to affect change with a wide demographic of people from country to hip hop and everything in between. And there's tremendous power in the music industry and these venues and us getting together like this to unite us and show our strength and to ultimately save the planet and fight pollution. And thank you so much to Anna Christina Cash and John Carter Cash for being here and Joe Cash. I love you guys. Y'all are some of my favorite people. I, you treat me so well and feed me and take care of me and show me love. <laughs> the values that your family has had for generations are very important and illustrative of what the river keepers are doing. One more thing, I, my family has strong roots in the civil rights environment. I was raised by a prominent civil rights family. My maternal ancestors are Republicans that have stood up against the Confederacy, against the Klan, against George Wallace and Bull Connor in Alabama for seven generations. But I was also raised by one of the most prominent Democratic families of the North. Having those deep roots in the South and the North, the Republicans and the Democrats, it's shown me tremendous balance. This sort of yin-yang mentality that, that it's needed to build these bridges to unite our country. And water is one of the most, it's a lowest common denominator issue, as I say, it's a uniting issue. And we need to continue, tell your friends, there's strength in our numbers, we need to continue to stand up for water and to stand up to the bully corporations who are polluting the planet. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Anna Christina Cash and John Carter Cash. And thank y'all so much for being here. All right. Whoa. Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome. Looking around the room, I and think. Thank you, David, yeah, for the intro. Thank you so and much, David. I think there's probably seven or eight people here that I've walked through rivers with. <laughs> looking around the room. <laughs> really grateful to be here today, and grateful to be performing and making music to support something that that we believe in. I hope to always make a difference in the right way.